So as we consider collecting this data, we're looking at data that's going to be very, very high dimensional from high throughput experiments and is also going to be better, very heterogeneous. So we thought a lot about what are the computational challenges that we're going to face. And the first thing I want to point out is that sort of in the ideal world, we have this promise that we're going to get this very, very high dimensional view of how the body works of each of our cells, right? So we're going to have this huge matrix of cells by genes. But as we know, it's actually not going to look exactly like that. There's a lot of noise in the data, and there's a lot of dropout. So we're going to have a lot of zeros in this matrix. right? Um, so this is going to obscure some of the inferences we want to make about the biological system that we're studying. And particularly, it's going to do things like destroy correlations between gene expression. When you have dropout like this, a nice correlation between two genes gets these huge you know, <laughs> dots on the axes that mess up a lot of the inferences that we'd like to, to make. Um, it might actually destroy clustering in some cases, so we really have to consider what the data looks like as we think about the methods that we're going to use. So we talked about a few main points. One of the first was scalability. So if we have really this huge number of cells that we'd like to study, it's going to be very different from the analyses that we've been working on so far, right? Um, so the properties that we talked about that we'd like algorithms to have if we were going to apply them to this data is that, of course, we're going to, first of all, want our methods to be able to run on distributed systems. So methods that can work with partitions of data, even if they you know, end up cross-talking with each other, partitioning the data is going to be key. Um, we'd like methods, ideally, that are linear or sublinear in running time. One of the properties that I think will be useful is algorithms that can do incremental up updates. Uh, so for instance, online methods in machine learning and other things like that, where you can run an analysis on uh, sort of incoming data as you go. Um, again, getting back to the distributed systems, we'd like methods that sort of divide and conquer. Uh, one thought about this is, even thinking about clustering, that maybe this has been mentioned already, we want to do sort of a coarse grain clustering at the top, but then we'd like to you know, focus in on subclusters and things like that without having to consider the entire space. So considering pieces of the data at a time, I think will be really useful. And how you piece those different pieces of data, uh, different data, different ways will depend on the actual strategy that you're looking at. We want algorithms that can potentially exploit sparsity. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, and again, getting back to this updating, we think Bayesian methods and algorithms that can use priors based on subsets of the data or things like that will be very useful. So one uh, question that was raised in the notes beforehand was whether or not we would like to do downsampling. So if we're going to have this huge data, do we want to just consider subsets of it at a time? And I think different analyses may want to use this. Um, the strategy for downsampling will be different based on the questions that you're asking. So in some cases, you may be happy with a completely random subsampling. Uh, you may instead want to do spatial subsampling, you know, evenly you know, looking at space and taking even samples from each region of interest. Uh, again, getting back to this divide and conquer for clustering, you may want to consider individual clusters at a time or a hierarchical strategy for downsampling rather than just simply random or spatial. However, we think primarily this is useful during methods development or QC or questions that are really only asked from particular subsets of the data. I mean, we're collecting this data for a reason. So overall, for most of our analysis, I think we ultimately don't want to downsample, except during development and asking specific questions. You know, we really want to take advantage of the amount of data that we have. Um, but it can be useful for, again, things like creating priors. So sparsity was a big focus as well. So we know we have sparse measurements in terms of expressed genes. We're going to have a lot of zeros. We're going to have only some cells and other features, other types of data that we collect may be missing for different components as well. So compressed forms may be useful um, for more robust represent representations of data. We talked about things like how to uh, get distance metrics on comp compressed forms. We also talked about how we could represent the data, right? We could do discretization of the data. There may even be some methods that benefit from fully binarizing the data. Yes, the gene was observed. No, it was not observed. Uh, we could do PCA-based reduction, dimensionality reduction. Or we may do no reduction at all. In many cases, I think that will probably be the answer. And we may even keep transcript-level data rather than gene-level data in many cases. Uh, we also talked about the fact that the amount of data we have may help us deal with sparsity in some cases. So for instance, if we're measuring correlation between two genes expression with enough cells and enough data, we may actually just simply be able to throw out the ones where, we, where they're zero or we think they're dropping out. So the size of the data might help us cut corners in this case. We also talked a lot about methods um, 
that can actually use the sparsity or use the uncertainty in particular ways. So Bayesian methods that actually model the sparsity or model the uncertainty of some of the measurements rather than throwing them out or ignoring them. So things like that we think will be important as well. And I think that brings us to a really important question that we debated a bit, which is imputation and correction. So again, we're going to have lots of zeros, but one perspective is that there's actually nothing missing, right? It's not missing, it's, down, it's subsampled. So we're getting some number of reads and we simply don't observe reads for some genes. That's not the same as missingness. However, we do have potentially greater uncertainty around those values that are zeros. So one perspective is that imputation here is really risky. We can introduce bias into any of the methods that we apply into any of the conclusions that we make by imputing our data. Um, so we may want to avoid it as much as possible and instead focus on methods that deal with zeros and deal with uncertainty inside the algorithm rather than pre-imputing. However, my perspective is that there are going to be methods that we want to apply that do assume full, full observation and don't take into account uncertainty. I think that's inevitable that some people will want to apply methods like that. So then how do we think about imputation? What are the desirable properties? And the perspective is that maybe instead of thinking of it as imputation, we think of it as error correction and rate estimation rather than thinking of this as missing data that we are then imputing. So there was a suggestion of using methods like uh, auto neural network based autoencoder type methods and things like that that can train uh, on these type of data. So if we do want to make inferences inside the algorithm or ahead of applying some algorithm about what these zeros mean or what the missing data means, we might be able to use the multi-omic data um, as an outside source of evidence. Rather than purely imputing just from the gene expression matrix, we can use outside evidence to provide some basis as well. And there's even ideas using things like protein staining that can help us identify whether or not a gene is expressed in a truly bimodal or multimodal fashion, or whether it's sort of evenly expressed across the cells. Um, bulk data, in some sense, can help us establish at least what the average level of expression would be. Of course, it's not going to tell us about the modality. Um, but it can give us some signal as well. So we think really incorporating outside data rather than just using the expression matrix alone will be a good way to do this. And I think one thing is that it is going to be difficult to evaluate the success of any of these methods, given that we don't have a great gold standard. So there, we had a few ideas around this, such as doing experiments where we really sort cells down to fairly similar types or synchronize or use synchronized cells to establish whether our imputation method is really identifying modality correctly, things like that. Um, we can use bulk measurements of very similar cell types in a, in a similar way. And one thought was we could get very deep sequencing for some subset of cells as well. So those are ideas around benchmarking, but I think you know, how we deal with these zeros is going to be really important, whether it's inside the algorithms that we're using or as a pre-processing type of step. So those are the main ideas that we considered and happy to take further discussion. Thank you, Alexis. Questions Where for Alexis and Svita? Yeah. Dominic, down at the front. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the concept of um, imputing correctly, but, but my worry would be that, um, that, that you deal with technical as well as biological variability here. And the technical uh, variability is, of course, um, uh, it's of course okay to try to correct for this. But I would be worried that I also, by imputing, smoothen my data and get rid of the biological variability, which is very informative. Yeah, I think that is a risk. And as we said, we, we do think that any sort of imputation or you know, correction type of strategy risks introducing bias and potentially risks obscuring true biological variability. It's very hard to distinguish zeros that come from technical, technical issues versus zeros that come from true biological signal. And that is why we think that incorporating uncertainty around that into the analysis methods themselves may be a better strategy than pre-processing imputation. Do you also want to impute as minimally as possible? Yeah. So if you, okay, we can um, switch so, thoughts. So if you, um, it sort of average out everything into a bulk measurement, you've lost the single cell nature of it, so it's also kind of the amount of imputation that matters. We want to impute minimally. Okay. Fabian? We copy a lot of our, uh, our methodological ideas from epidemiology, right? And I'm sorry, can you? We copy a lot of our analysis ideas from epidemiology, just replacing cells, uh, people by cells, right? And I think 
uh, one thing that there, particularly in genetics, has been super successful is imputation. You know, like going 1,000 genomes imputation. This is sort of, sort of, I think, super accepted. So I told you, well, John. I think, okay, some people, do, a lot of people do it. <laughs> oh, no, I accept it in that context. I'm just not sure about this context. But go on. So, yeah, I, I, was, so I was exactly wondering, if for, just for clustering, we need a few, uh, a, a few dominant genes. In this, I, I, I see for the correlation, I can see that there's a lot of issues coming in. But for the few dominant genes, don't you think that imputing wouldn't actually matter all that much? It might actually maybe really clean up your thing? Yeah, I mean, I, we of course are less likely to see zeros for the highly expressed and key genes in each sort of cell type, right? But yeah, I think if, if you're just getting a little bit of dropout or missingness, I wouldn't call it missingness, zeros for a gene, then especially for a method like clustering, it's probably totally reasonable to fill them in using imputation. But if you're really trying to understand the you know, correlation between genes, the difference in expression of very lowly expressed genes and some trajectory, things like that, I think you could really introduce a lot of bias by trying to fill it in ahead of time. And success of imputation depends on the data, right? So imputing missing genotypes, we are very successful at, but I think we don't know how successful we will be at filling these values in in single cell data, and so I think that's part of why it's so important to establish some kind of benchmark to evaluate that. Maybe it will be much more successful than I'm predicting. In the middle. Just with the microphone, please. You would impute something that you didn't measure, not something that you measured and got zero. So right. if, you, if you're doing a multi-omic thing and you didn't measure methylation, yes. but you did measure RNA, then you could impute the methylation perhaps. Yes, absolutely. So there is definitely <laughs> a difference between truly missing data and zeros in the expression measurements. Did, Those, and different if, strategies could be applied. Or if you did it. RNA yeah. sequencing and you did some sort of selection and you're not right. measuring, you're only measuring five genes, then you could impute all the genes that you haven't measured. Yeah. But if you've done a, a complete RNA measurement and you got zero. It's not missing. It's, it's not just, missing. It's potentially it's wrong, but it's not missing, right? Yeah. Ollie. Maybe one, one thing that I, I thought was quite useful when we discussed that is that it's, it's also useful you know, to think about the nomenclature, how we call these things, we just realize this here, right, that imputations of zeros is a very different game than projecting on a different layer. And the question may be how we call these things, because many of these controversies are called from basically using different terms for that. For example, mm -hmm. another area we realize is that many of the imputation methods effectively use a model that is very sensible, for example, that looks at different trajectories and different dimensions and projects it back on genes to very, very valuable interpretations. On that front, it's a much less controversy term than if we call it imputations of zero. So it's, it's always a, I think there's a, a lot of um, nomenclature we develop in the field and how we refer to those, and these things definitely have a place, yeah. um, but have to be used with caution, maybe. Yeah, we had ideas to basically call it either denoising, error correction, or something like that, right. rather than missing values in a Netflix matrix sense.